Wonderful. So welcome everyone to BIDMC Cardiology Grand Rounds. Uh, we're very pleased to have Dr. Ahmed Tawakal from Mass General Hospital join us to give today's seminar. Uh, Dr. Tawakal serves as the Director of Nuclear Cardiology and the Co-Director of the Cardiovascular Imaging Research Center at MGH. Um, he's an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. And by way of background, he obtained his medical degree uh, at Stanford, um, then came uh, back to the Boston area to train at Brigham and Women's Hospital for internal medicine, cardiology, and then MGH for nuclear cardiology. And at MGH, um, as we'll see today uh, in his talk, he's really been a pioneer in the area of PET imaging. Just, I just lost one of my uh, earbuds. Sorry about that. Hopefully, can everyone hear me okay? Let me pick it up and find it. Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. I wasn't sure which way the... Uh... <laughs> Um, so as I was saying, uh, Dr. Tabakal has really been a pioneer in PET imaging and atherosclerosis and more broadly um, mechanisms by which stress causes cardiovascular disease. Um, and he has performed really fascinating work where he's shown um, in humans that um, activity in the amygdala, which determines stress, can actually influence uh, subsequent cardiovascular disease events. Um, he's a principal investigator on multiple studies that have been funded by the NIH, by industry sponsors, and by foundations. And so thank you very much for joining us, Ahmed. We look forward to your talk. It's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with, with uh, so many uh, colleagues that I've known for many, many years. Um, my disclosures. So perhaps the best place to start off is to acknowledge that the attributable cardiovascular disease risk of psychosocial stress is on par with that for smoking, dyslipidemia, hypertension, and diabetes, yet relatively little had been known about the mechanisms that translate stress to cardiovascular disease. Large studies, such as the Interheart study published back in 2004, for example, looked at many patients across the world and found a consistent association between, in this case, marital stress or work-related stress and cardiovascular disease events. And you can see here that the, the overall risk associated with stress was relatively high, what you would expect with say diabetes or hypertension. And in fact, stress can affect many risk factors that increase heart disease. Stress increases hypertension associated with increased smoking, physical inactivity, and overeating. However, what I had suggested was the increased attributable risk persists despite correcting for all these additional risk factors. So what might be the mechanism linking stress to cardiovascular disease? Some key insights were developed through animal models. And so how do you create stress in animal models, you can actually put a, a, a cap on a cage of mice and that certainly induces stress or you can simply shake the, shake the cages or uh, repetitively switch litter mates. All of these things increase stress within these animals. That leads to bone marrow activation. So within the bone marrow stem cell niche, you can find an increase in the mobilization and output of monocytes, for example. In these animal models, you can follow these monocytes. Some will be stored in the spleen. Some will continue into atherosclerotic areas, such as the arterial wall. And you can see the upregulation of arterial inflammation in response to stress. So the question we asked is whether an analogous system uh, is, is present in humans, the same model for increase in events where stress begets the progenital, uh, progenitor release from bone marrows, increase extramedullary monocytopoiesis, arterial inflammation, and whether that could then lead to a higher risk of myocardial infarction. And what is the role of the brain in all of this? So we can use PET-CT imaging to assess multiple aspects of this potential pathway in humans. And in fact, fluorodeoxyglucose is one of the uh, markers that we can use to test this in particular. So uh, with fluorodeoxyglucose, which is like glucose, it enters through glucose transporters into the cells, then hexokinase will phosphorylate it. And while glucose likewise is phosphorylated, it then goes towards uh, glycolysis. Fluorodeoxyglucose, on the other hand, is metabolically trapped. And so the accumulation of uh, fluorodeoxyglucose simply gives you an index of glycolysis. 
And this index of glycolysis has been used over the decades to tell us something about brain activity, inflammation, tumor activity, ischemic or hibernating myocardium. So for example, here's a study where we looked at bone marrow uh, activity, in this case, bone marrow metabolism. And you can see here's a person with a recent ACS and here's a person with stable coronary disease. The person with recent ACS has this upregulated bone marrow activity compared to the patient with stable CAD. In fact, this upregulated activity associates with systemic markers of inflammation like CRP, TNF-alpha, and IO-1 beta, but also gene expression in leukocytes. Moreover, the higher the degree of upregulation here in patients without a history of coronary disease, the greater the risk. So if you simply divide the activity by median, those with a greater than median activity have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. This tells us that leukopoietic tissue activation in humans is easily measurable and is a predictor of cardiovascular disease events. So that's part of what we can measure akin to what was seen in the animal models. What about the arteries? Well, it turns out that FDG has long been used to look at inflammation. Um, when we think of FDG in our clinical training years, you think about FDG as, as used in oncology for tumor imaging. Well, clearly there's no surprise that if you have a tumor model, you would see that FDG will accumulate in the tumor cells. What might su surprise many of you is that actually even more of the FDG signal is related to its intake by macrophages in the macrophage associated tissues here. So FDG tumor imaging in part relies on inflammation imaging. The other thing I wanna add is that the uptake by macrophages and monocytes associates very nicely with a metabolic activity. And it's not simply therefore the number of metabolically active cells, but actually the degree to which TNF alpha production, the degree to which those cells are pro-inflammatory. So if you turn up the pro-inflammatory activity of resting macrophages and monocytes, their uh, metabolic activity and therefore their FDG uptake increases. So we can take advantage of this for arterial imaging. So here you can see, this is a human uh, uh, arterial imaging. This is the aorta and you can see increased FDG uptake by PET. You can also see if you looked at the carotids, these are two patients with carotid disease, both have tight carotid stenosis. This one has a lot of FDG uptake. This patient has little FDG uptake. And overall, what we find is that the FDG uptake associates with macrophage density. So again, you can use FDG for arterial imaging to look for inflammation. This has been reproduced by multiple groups over the years. And in fact, if you can look at these R values in groups that have compared the FDG uptake to histological measures in patients who had end arterectomy, it was a relatively consistently high association with R values in the 0.5 to 0.8 range for uh, predicting the histological measures of inflammation. Not only that, the change in activity is predictive of successful treatment effects. What do I mean by that? Drugs that have been shown to reduce cardiovascular disease events and whose mechanism is thought to relate to a reduction in inflammation, at least in part, tend to have reductions on, tend to induce reductions in FDG imaging. So statins, for example, nicely reduce the uh, FDG arterial signal. TZDs, inter interleukin-1 beta antagonists, PCSK9 antagonists, all of them reduce the uh, signal by FDG PET. On the other hand, drugs that tend not to improve cardiovascular disease events, such as CETP antagonists, LPPLA2 antagonists, P38 myocardial antagonists, and more recently methotrexate, all fail to also reduce the uh, PET signal. Moreover, this same signal of the arteries predicts cardiovascular disease events very nicely and independently of risk factors. So here are four studies that looked at arterial signals and then followed patients for several years afterwards. And in each of these cases, those with higher signals you can see here, had higher event rates. I do also want to plug an ongoing style, uh, perspective trial that's looking at arterial imaging and assessing the ability to predict cardiovascular disease events. 
This is a uh, multi-center trial across a, uh, a dozens of countries funded by the IAEA looking to recruit 1,100 patients and testing the hypothesis that the arterial signal independently predicts cardiovascular disease events. So what I've shown so far is that you can pick up the arterial signal, you can look at the bone marrow signal, all using these uh, imaging modalities. What about clinical uses? Well, we are currently using it to look at aortitis, device infection, sarcoidosis, and endocarditis. So PET-CT today is used clinically and is guidelines indicated for several inflammatory endpoints. So with that drawn, we have a tool here, PET-CT, that can test this system that was hypothesized based on animal studies. And now we can look at the question of whether or not stress leads to myocardial infarction. But what about the brain again? So I mentioned these downstream parts, but how is the brain figuring into this? Well, I would say that one way we can measure stress is to give you a, a questionnaire. And there's the perceived stress scale 10 questionnaire that is uh, easily obtained on the internet, um, very quick to um, fill out. And you can get a score to tell you where you stand relative to others in terms of perceived stress. You can also use imaging. So imaging gives you a great advantage over a questionnaire in that a lot of individuals don't really recognize the degree to which they actually feel stress. It takes a little work to actually get the insight into how stress is, is being registered. Moreover, the way you perceive stress might not directly relate to how your body is processing it. What do I mean by that? So first of all, stress involves several aspects of your brain. Importantly, uh, there is in, in control, top-down control by the prefrontal cortex, and there is important inputs by the limbic system with the amygdala playing a key role. And you can think of it this way, the stress or changes in your, in your life or changes in your environment are picked up by the amygdala and your top-down control is instructing the limbic system that either it's something to worry about or it's nothing to worry about. And I would say that during uh, alert non-stress situations, your top-down control with a prefrontal cortex should be playing an important role, hopefully right now during this, this talk. Whereas during stressful conditions, your limbic system is playing a very important role. Moreover, over time, stress actually will change the relative uh, growth of the neurons or the presence of neurons in, in those systems. So for example, chronic stress is associated with greater and persistent dendritic growth and persistent spine formation in the amygdala, where on the other hand, it reduces the medial prefrontal cortical neural uh, branching. Uh, this is a pretty unfortunate trade-off. Similarly, the hippocampus, where you have short-term memory, is uh, also going to be adversely affected by chronic stress with reversible dendritic atrophy and reduced neurogenesis. So what about imaging those aspects? We know from MRI imaging that you can uh, nicely image the amygdala, and that amygdalar activation associates with hypertension, with inflammation, in this case, interleukin-6, and with the atherosclerotic uh, measures such as intima media thickness. We also know from animal models, in this case, uh, a primate model, that amygdalar activity associates with the temperament of these animals. So for example, in this large group of, of uh, primates, amygdalar activity associated with how anxious these animals appeared, and interestingly, also predicted their future behavior. If you imaged young primates, amygdalar activity predicted their adult uh, anxiety. So we can use this, therefore, PET-MR, PET-CT, to look at several aspects of the system that we're interested in. Uh, we can measure the brain looking at both structure and function. We can look at functional reactivity. We can look at the leukopoietic activity. And of course, we can look at the arteries, either structure and the inflammation. So several aspects can be tested 
non-invasively. So in fact, we did use multi-system imaging with FDG PET-CT and PET-MR to assess the mechanisms relating stress to cardiovascular disease in humans. We quantified stress-associated cortical limbic activity as amygdalar activity divided by counter-regulatory cortical activity. We looked at leukopoietic activity from the bone marrow and the spleen and arterial inflammation and followed up our patients for five years through medical record review. We started off with a population of 579 patients and ended up with a final group here after excluding individuals who uh, lacked sufficient imaging. And what we found is that um, individuals who developed the vent, there were 22, had many of the expected risk factors. Moreover, we found that there was a tendency of those who had subsequent cardiovascular events to have higher amygdala activity. Here, this is where the amygdala is. Higher amygdala activity relative to counter-regulatory activity. So this person, for example, had an index of amygdala activity of 0.89 to 0.87 to one, whereas the person who did not have a subsequent event had half as high an amygdala activity. And this person without an event who had low amygdala activity also had low levels of arterial inflammation and bone marrow activity. Whereas the person with an event and high amygdala activity had high arterial inflammation and high bone marrow activity. Moreover, when we looked at the relationship between the stress associated neural activity and subsequent cardiovascular disease events, we found a significant association after uh, adjusting for risk factors or even after adjusting for pre-existing atherosclerotic disease as indicated by a coronary calcium score. Moreover, when we then looked at cardiovascular disease as an endpoint and then started using more stringent definitions such as MACE or atherothrombotic MACE, the risk went up. So it's an even better predictor of atherothrombotic MACE. We then asked, is there an association between amygdala activity and these measures downstream, akin to what would be expected from uh, the animal study findings? And we found just that. We found that the stress neural activity nicely associated with atherosclerotic inflammation and bone marrow activity uh, in, these, in, in these humans, as in the animals. And in fact, through mediation, we saw that stress associated neural activity links to cardiovascular disease through a mechanism that includes enhanced bone marrow activity and arterial inflammation in series, very nicely replicating the human models, uh, the animal models, sorry. So these data have been uh, replicated and extended subsequently. So here's a study of uh, over 200 individuals who were studied with PET-CT and CTA where they measured aortic inflammation, hematopoietic, uh, hematopoietic activity, amygdala activity, and coronary plaque. And with the CTA, what they found is that stress-associated neural activity also associated with non-calcified plaque volume. More recently, uh, a study of patients with, with recent myocardial infarction showed that those presenting with acute myocardial infarction had higher amygdala activity compared to individuals with chronic coronary disease. And importantly, they found uh, nice associations between amygdala cortical ratio and aortic inflammation, bone marrow activity, and perceived stress, very nicely replicating the prior studies. Moreover, they found this an in, uh, interesting association. They found that among individuals presenting with ACS, if you looked at the complexity of their coronary plaques, those with more complex plaques actually had higher amygdala activity compared to those with non-complex uh, uh, plaques. And similarly, those with higher syntax scores had greater amygdala activity compared to those with lower syntax scores. Interesting, because all of these patients presented with MI, why then would those with more complex plaques have higher amygdala activity. That begs the question of whether or not the amygdala activity was upregulated before presentation as well. Very recently also, uh, studies have shown that mental stress ischemia also associate with a greater risk of subsequent events 
let me take you through this uh, very briefly because this is a slightly different concept than what I had shown before. I was showing data around brain imaging of chronic stress. In this case, uh, the, this group was inducing mental stress by asking patients to count backwards, for example, and then looking at differences in their stress response. So in, in a case where they acutely cause mental stress and then measure measures of, uh, assess measures of ischemia, they found that those who have no measures, no evidence of ischemia, say by SPECT imaging, compared to those with conventional stress ischemia, say by exercise, compared to those who have measures of ischemia with only mental stress, or those who have both mental and conventional stress ischemia. And you can see that mental stress has a greater association with subsequent cardiovascular disease events compared to those with conventional stress. And those who have both evidence have the greatest risk. So chronic measures of stress and acute measures of stress really are predictive of subsequent cardiovascular disease events. And this is how it might be linked. A model here where stress induces corticolimbic changes that lead to increased sympathetic nervous system activity, that will trigger the inflammation, but also the increased HPA axis activity also triggers inflammation in part through sympathetic nervous system. And all of this leads to more atherosclerotic inflammation and subsequently these uh, will collude to increase cardiovascular disease risk. So what about chronic stressors? I've been talking about stress, but stress is the body's response. The stressors are what people are subjected to that can lead to that. Now we have lots of data on chronic stressors such as socioeconomic stress and environmental stressors. And low SES and chronic noise, for example, have long been associated with cardiovascular disease. And we wanted to ask if stress associated pathways that we've been studying may partially mediate the, the links between these factors and cardiovascular disease. So first let's talk about socioeconomic stress. It's long been observed that lower income associates with worse outcomes. So for example, if we use something such as expected age of death, we see that those at the lower end of the pay scale, in this case, the first quartile, will die younger than those at the higher end of the pay scale. And these data have been pretty consistent over the decades. So more recent data, for example, shows the same trends, maybe even widening over the time in terms of disparities in expected age of death. Here's another way to ask this. This very nice study uh, conducted by the Eric Group showed that individuals who have a change in income, especially those who have a drop in income, have a higher uh, risk of cardiovascular disease events. And what's interesting here is they observed this difference after adjusting for cardiovascular disease risk factors, healthcare access, and even income at the start of the study. So either your income or change in income associates with cardiovascular disease events. So in our study, we looked at patients' uh, income and compared it to amygdala activity and arterial inflammation. And the first thing I can tell you is that as other studies have shown, those with lower income had a higher risk of death uh, of, of cardiovascular disease events compared to those with higher income. Moreover, what we found is that amygdala activity or, or stress-associated neural activity tended to decrease as income increased. And similarly, arterial inflammation tended to decrease as income increases. And what we found is that socioeconomic uh, status linked to MACE in part through a system that included upregulated amygdala activity, bone marrow activity, and arterial inflammation in series. What about noise? So noise is another chronic stressor. Um, the World Health Organization defines high noise as uh, greater than 55 decibels. And lots and lots of studies have shown that, disturbance, that noise causes disturbance of activities, sleep, communication, annoyance, 
and that all of this leads to cardiometabolic uh, disease events and a greater risk of cardiovascular disease. In our cohort, we similarly studied noise measured at the uh, patient's homes, and we used several different thresholds. We used uh, lower uh, upper tertile, upper quartile, and the World Health Organization cutoff. And in all these cases, you can see that the higher levels of noise indeed increased uh, levels of, of cardiovascular disease events, as would be expected from many, many prior studies. Moreover, what we observed is that as noise increased, so too did the stress-associated neural activity. And we found in our cohort that increased noise linked to MACE in part through higher amygdala activity and greater arterial inflammation, which in retrospect should be no surprise. How else would noise enter the body except for the brain? And that makes sense uh, since in here, we found that the amygdala was quite increased. And we suspect that the link to MACE is through the amygdala, SNS activation, systemic inflammation, atherosclerotic inflammation in MACE, but also acknowledge that there are other effects. The HPA axis activity, for example, and adverse health behaviors may enhance metabolic diseases. And of course, there should be other biological and non-biological effects also contributing to MACE. So pay attention to noise as a potential risk factor for your patients. I would be remiss in uh, talking about stress if I didn't mention uh, acute stress syndrome such as Takotsubo. So obviously it's an acute, usually reversible heart failure syndrome often triggered by emotional or physical stressors. Though the pathogenesis is not fully understood, the link between the brain and the heart has long been proposed as a factor. There uh, was this intriguing uh, uh, fMRI study from a couple of years back that studied 15 patients with Takotsubo and 39 controls. Um, and with fMRI, they observed that Takotsubo associated with impaired cortical limbic connectivity, notably involving the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex. Now, these patients had a history of Takotsubo. And so it's unknown whether these observed changes were present before the onset of disease. And so we did a study where we identified 41 individuals who developed Takotsubo after baseline imaging. And uh, we identified 63 match controls. And what I can tell you first is that the individuals who developed subsequent Takotsubo tended to have higher amygdalar activity when divided by counter-regulatory activity from the temporal lobe or from the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And here I'll give you uh, some of these findings. So for example, the individuals with subsequent Takotsubo had higher amygdala activity compared to those who did not. And these were again, age and gender match, but you can see that there's a lot of overlap. And we were interested in that overlap. So first look at this. If we broke our cohort of subsequent Takotsubo patients into those with a greater than one standard deviation, uh, uh, increase in stress-associated uh, uh, limbic uh, activity compared to those with lower levels, and then ask about the timing. This group here who had the lower activity tended to have their Takotsubo events later on. So these individuals developed on average Takotsubo two and a half years after imaging, whereas the folks who had the highest imaging uh, signals tended to have Takotsubo within a year after imaging. So there may be an association between how active the amygdala is at the time of imaging and the risk of Takotsubo. That is, of course, in the cohort who subsequently developed Takotsubo. And you might ask, well, wait a second, how does that make sense? Isn't Takotsubo a syndrome that happens when you are exposed to a once in a lifetime stressor? Well, not exactly. Turns out that there are a few patients who actually had the classic Takotsubo stressors, such as death of a spouse, death of a child, and clearly your brain activity is not gonna predict when that's gonna happen. However, a lot of patients who developed Takotsubo had it after an acute illness, such as um, pneumonia or a, a, a fracture. And in some cases it was after um, a colonoscopy or um, uh, they were told that they, they had a, a, a diagnosis of cancer. Uh, 
And so we hypothesize that there is an interaction between brain activity and your susceptibility to subsequent uh, triggering uh, when encountering an emotional or physical stressor, such that those with higher stress-associated neural activity have a greater susceptibility of neural centers to activation by these stressful events. And those will then have a greater neural activation and exaggerated systemic response to stress. And if it's high enough, will lead to the neurohormonal abnormalities, sympathetic nervous system output, and inflammation that we see with Takotsubo. So now that I've set the table and shown the uh, various ways that stress may lead to cardiovascular disease events, can we do anything to reduce the stress-associated corticolimbic activity? We can, apparently. So there have been studies that show that stress reduction approaches can lead to a reduction in perceived stress and that these reductions in perceived stress lead to beneficial changes in uh, amygdalar uh, measures, in this case, amygdalar uh, gray matter. Moreover, uh, this particular study by Blumenthal et al. published a few years back, took individuals with a recent uh, cardiovascular disease event or with an, uh, an intervention, PCI. And um, for some of the patients, they randomized them to standard cardiac rehab versus cardiac rehab plus a stress reduction, enhanced cardiac rehab, in other words. And also they had a non-randomized group and then followed all of these for five years. First, the stress redu reduction was associated with a reduction in anxiety. Um, I guess that shouldn't be a, uh, a surprise. Moreover, if you look at the non-randomized group, no, uh, no cardiac rehab, they had the highest event rate. And as expected, there was a reduction in events in the uh, standard cardiac rehab group. And then surprisingly, a robust further reduction in events in the enhanced cardiac rehab group, those who also had the uh, stress reduction. So clearly there are promising signals in terms of the opportunity to reduce cardiovascular disease events with stress reduction techniques on top of standard cardiac rehab. And we're further evaluating this here. We have a study that's evaluating mechanisms linking stress to atherosclerosis, ongoing studies here. And also we have an ongoing stress reduction study, which I would invite you to collaborate with us on, uh, where we're testing the hypothesis that an eight week stress reduction course results in a reduction in several of those brain and systemic signals. We're also um, leveraging our biobank to further study lifestyle on some of these parameters. Um, our MGB biobank has uh, um, over 120,000 participants. Uh, we've so far looked at uh, close to 19,000 of them. 50,000 of them provided lifestyle data and many of them uh, have given us genetic data as well. And what I can tell you, uh, we've been studying the effect of moderate alcohol intake, for example, uh, on cardiovascular disease events. And as, as uh, you have seen through many, many studies over the decades, uh, moderate alcohol intake associates with a reduction in cardiovascular disease events, and even in this cohort, all-cause mortality. Uh, but we also see an increase in cancer risk. Uh, this is also a well-observed phenomenon. Moreover, in this cohort, where we see this nice reduction in cardiovascular disease events, this J-shaped curve that we see with low to moderate to high uh, uh, alcohol, we see very similar changes in brain activity, where moderate alcohol activity uh, intake associates with a reduction in stress-associated corticolimbic activity that mirrors what you see here. And then again, a J-shaped relationship where uh, excess alcohol drinking associates with higher neural activity. Interestingly here too, we asked, is this stress neural activity change driven by amygdalar changes or is it driven by prefrontal changes? And we see that it's driven primarily by reduction in the, prefrontal, in the amygdalar uh, activity. There is not an increase in prefrontal activity. In fact, there is a non-significant reduction in prefrontal activity with moderate alcohol intake. Also, we asked whether moderate alcohol 
relates to reductions in MACE via changes in the brain. And we found that there is an indirect path that includes the brain that was significant, accounting for roughly 10% of the overall observed effect. The other thing that we're interested in is the relationship between exercise and MACE. And um, in our cohort of 50,000 individuals, we looked at uh, their specific activities and they listed dozens of activities. We signed each of their activities a metabolic equivalent and then looked at their metabolic equivalent minutes per uh, week and compared the quintiles of that to MACE events. And unsurprisingly, you can see that as you go from the first to second to fifth, et cetera, you could have uh, reductions in MACE events. And if you see the unadjusted MACE risk, it's uh, nice and straightforward, a nice dose effect. Uh, when you look at adjusted MACE, you see a steep decline followed by a plateauing, which is again, something that has been seen by many, many groups. And for those of you who are interested, this area here where the steep decline occurs is right at the sweet spot of roughly 150 to 300 minute, uh, minutes of moderate intensity uh, exercise per week. So these data very, very nicely replicate what's been seen over the decades. Moreover, what we saw with brain imaging is a beautiful dose reduction in uh, stress associated neural activity uh, as you go from the lowest level of exercise to the highest level of exercise. And we found in this cohort that exercise in part leads to reduction in uh, uh, MI risk through beneficial changes in the brain, uh, at least through this mediation analysis. We asked the additional question is amygdala activity divided by stress neural activity, is it driven by reductions in amygdala activity or is it driven by increases in prefrontal cortical activity? When we looked at the amygdala activity, we saw beneficial trends, in other words, beneficial reductions in amygdala activity, but it didn't quite uh, reach significance. Whereas we more readily saw beneficial improvements in prefrontal cortical activity. In fact, this kind of change in prefrontal cortical activity associated with exercise has also been seen in the animal models. So key points here, I uh, wanna stress that um, uh, psychosocial stress is a common important risk factor for cardiovascular disease with an attributable risk on par with hypertension, smoking and, and diabetes. Um, it associates with higher stress associated neurobiological activity. And that in turn associates with bone marrow activity, systemic inflammation, arterial inflammation and non-calcified plaques as well as cardiovascular disease events. The impact might be modifiable, but large trials are needed in order to prove causation and determine efficacy of interventions. But I would say that the next best steps for individuals with high atherosclerotic risk and high stress, it's reasonable to recommend stress reduction approaches, exercise, and I didn't add this as a, as, as a comment before, but better sleep as well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ahmed. That was a wonderful talk. We have a couple of questions that have come in and actually um, one that's very pertinent to your uh, recent comment about sleep. So I'll start with a question from uh, Dr. Warren Manning, who says, wonderful presentation, like Alvin and the Chipmunks would say, worry never helped anyone yet. Um, are there data on the more or less stressful occupations within medicine or within subspecialties of cardiology with regards to stress and outcomes? So for instance, is night call an occupational hazard for which we should be receiving hazard pay? Uh, I really appreciate that question. Um, I would say we should ask some of the residents and fellows how they feel about uh, stress. Uh, there are some data about stress and, and uh, um, being in the hospital. It's, it's interesting. In uh, the animal study that I pointed out with stress, they actually had a small human study where they measured uh, the bone marrow progenitor cells in residents who were rotating through the ICU, and they assessed it before and immediately after the ICU rotation. And they were able to show two things change. Of course, their um, perception of stress shot up at the end of their ICU rotation, but so too did their production of, uh, of immune progenitor cells, you know, the kinds of signals that would uh, be uh, unhealthy. So you know, your, your um, 
funny comments aside, you're you're right on it that that there are um, Im important health com uh, consequences of stressful rotations um, in terms of the differences between various groups. I'm not I'm not aware of that. That's interesting. Um, Kazi, did you want to come off mute and ask a question? Yes, um, that was great. Thank you for that. Um, I, I, I'm going to ask a question with the caveat that I missed the first five minutes, and so I don't know if you covered it, uh, covered this. As I look at the data correlating amygdala activity with the syntax score and uh, you know the more complexity of the atherosclerotic disease, I do wonder if some of that activity is reverse causal in the sense that is it possible that burden of inflammation in the body increases amygdala activity as well? So it's interesting. Um, there, there are two reasons for reverse causation in that case. You can have um, patients presenting with um, worsening chest pains, that you can have uh, greater levels of, of angina from an unstable anginal syn syndrome with more and more chest pain that, that it, on its own is gonna increase levels of stress and likely increase amygdala activity. But you also bring up a really interesting point. So in animal models, there is a feedback loop between amygdala activity or stress neural activity and inflammation, but also inflammation and increased stress neural activity. And I'll, I'll give you a, 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 an interesting vignette. There was an animal study that uh, looked at that reverse pathway and they found that if you stress animals, in this case, if they keep on switching litter mates, the animals who um, have switched litter mates will end up being more likely to produce um, um, increased immune cell production. And then they ask, well, could they interrupt that? Could, could, they, could, could they reduce the amount of, of activity that occurs? And they did some interesting experiments at that point. They gave uh, interleukin-6 antagonists and they found that if you give them their sense of stress is reduced. And the way they measured stress in the animals is by looking at interactions between the mice. After their, their stress, they followed the degree to which the mice would isolate. And so they have a scale for stress based on the degree to which an animal will isolate. And they found interleukin-6 interrupted that. They, they became more normal. And then they did something fascinating. They took the patients, the, the mice that were stressed and they, Trans, they, they did bone marrow transplants and they found that the recipients took on the stress behavior of the donors. So if they found a, a set of animals, each of which has been exposed to the stressor and they took the ones that manifested more stress, transplanted their bone marrow, the recipients manifested more stress. Whereas if they took animals that showed less stress and transplanted their bone marrow, the recipients acted less stress. And if they then took those more stress recipients of the bone marrow transplants and gave interleukin-6 antagonists, they behaved more normally. So that suggests that stress begets IL-6 production by bone marrow cells and that uh, that IL-6 might trigger more stress. So you're, you're exactly right. And that's why uh, that particular study in, a, in acute coronary syndromes could indicate reverse causation. But why then the increased syntax score? It could be, again, that um, a lot of the complexity differences occurred in the few weeks prior to the presentation. It could be. Can I push that a little farther and say, like, is, let's take completely asymptomatic individuals. And if you had a substantial burden of coronary disease, is it possible that your body is recognizing the physiologic stress that comes with extra uh, excessive coronary disease? Meaning not mediated through pain or an acute coronary syndrome, but just truly the physiologic distress of having coronary, obstructive coronary disease. I mean, it's a hypothesis. Um, it, it could be through, through inflammation. Uh, yeah. But the one thing I would say, though, is that in, in stable individuals without a history of any prior uh, CVD event, um, the stress signals are still predictive in the long term. 
So I do think that there are stronger evidence of a long-term causal pathway, but I do also acknowledge that there is a reverse causal mechanism that is also important. Um, and, and in this case, the reverse causal pathway might not be simply that, that there is a, uh, an increase in stress after um, an event, but potentially that that increased stress is potentiating the ongoing damage. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hey, thank you. So we have many questions coming in. I know Dr. Safitz has a question. I just wanna jump in with one quick comment from Dr. Jen Ho, because it's very relevant to what uh, Kazi had just uh, asked. Um, aside from the preclinical data, uh, Dr. Ho is asking whether there are genetic determinants of amyg amygdala activity and whether this might be a way to get around the reverse causation or confounding in the mediation analysis. So I'm just yeah, sort of tagging really, on quickly. Re really good question. So we, we looked at that in, in two contexts. We looked at it in the, in the um, MGB biobank as well as the UK biobank. And we used uh, a well-validated um, score that predicts uh, anxiety, depression, uh, neuroticism, and found that it potently predicts uh, the brain measures that I described, as well as structural changes, uh, the structural changes we got from the UK Biobank, and that those measures also predict cardiovascular disease events. And we saw, again, a nice mediation supporting genetics of stress, brain changes of stress to cardiovascular disease events. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Safitz, we'll take the next question from you. Yeah, thank you. Um, really fascinating talk. I, I understand your focus on arterial inflammation and myocardial infarction, but I'm wondering if there, any work has been done on myocardial inflammation uh, in, in heart failure or in other settings, because of course the heart is capable of mounting a very robust uh, innate immune response. So I'm just curious to know if any work has been done in that regard. So we haven't directly looked at uh, myocardial inflammation. It's, it's harder for us to measure that with some of the tools that, that we use with PET. It's, um, it's not sufficiently specific unless there is a lot of preparation that goes into it. Having said that, um, there are, in the context of Takotsubo, for example, that's, that's well-observed. Myocardial inf inflammation is associated with Takotsubo, for example. Um, and I would hypothesize that there would be an increase in myocardial inflammation in general. We're interested in looking at that with, with um, fibrosis as a, as a correlate of, of inflammation, of at least of chronic inflammation. And you're hinting uh, to um, myocardial structural changes. And I would say that we and others have seen that stress predicts um, um, changes in the myocardium with uh, HEFPEF, for example, as, as uh, an important output. Thank you. We have a question from Dr. Jeremy Robbins, uh, who says, very interesting presentation, and thank you. Are there data linking imaging and functional brain studies with large-scale plasma biochemicals, for instance, stress hormones plus, to help get at what is, for instance, relating exercise and stress? Um, is the CNS too big a barrier, no pun, to answer these questions? Yeah, that, that's interesting. So um, cortisol is, is often measured um, and it's a rather crude measurement. It's, um, it's, it's often misunderstood in terms of its uh, utility to predict stress. Think of it this way, cortisol is, uh, is anti-inflammatory and it's, used, it's, it's thought to be produced to regulate and combat some of the off-target effects of the stress, uh, real stress hormones, uh, the uh, sympathetic nervous system activity, for example. Uh, so when we measure cortisol in a person who hasn't seen too much stress, it really indicates nicely the acute stress. But in patients with chronic stress, you start to see a disconnect between the measured stress and the stressor and the production of cortisol. It's, uh, think of it as the body is getting exhausted and no longer keeping up the cortisol production to adequately combat stress. And, and so a lot of the things that we usually associate with stress acutely are rather crude because of the um, disconnect over time between their measure and the uh, other, other uh, more objective measures of stress. Your more important question is, you know, what else is being done to uh, look at the, 
biochemical signals that might uh, explain some of the observations that I just just uh, drew out. And I, I think um, some of the methods Rob Gersten's using, for example, uh, we were kind of hinting to that earlier before before this talk, would be beautifully applied to some of these studies to better understand these mechanisms. So in, in what I showed before, I was um, depicting cross-sectional uh, associations, or if it's a longitudinal study, we're looking at mediation analysis. What's really needed are perspective studies with multiple uh, assessments and then biochemical assays to better understand the real mediators. And then we can ask, are there mediators that we could interrupt or enhance? And you mentioned exercise. You know, that is a very good question. What exactly could be linking the observed um, changes that are seen in the brain to exercise? And you know, there are many hypotheses and there are some recent papers suggesting that there might be some uh, muscle-derived hormones that might explain some of this, but this is an area of great interest. And I think uh, there are several people uh, on, on this meeting today that have the tools that could answer a lot of that. Perfect, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Joe Canham, who asks, any information on types of exercise on reducing stress, i.e. is aerobic exercise better than weightlifting? Yeah, we haven't looked at that. Um, and, and we're starting to look at that. We're, we have some power to make simple uh, comparisons, but it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, I, I would hypothesize if you're just looking at stress, you would ask, um, you know, would it, would it be better in terms of stress reduction to spend um, you know, a few minutes in the boxing ring or better to have a moderate walk in the woods. Um, not, not clear what the answer would be, but I, I know what I prefer to do and what would make me feel better. Uh, I, I, I think there might be a difference between um, what is gonna lead to um, cardiovascular fitness versus what's gonna reduce uh, stress. Um, and I, I, I think it's important that we distinguish the, the pathways that they're complementary, but they're not necessarily fully overlapping. Um, I think it's a it's an area of active investigation, but I suspect that the, the, it, it, it might be important to, to recognize that some people might simply derive greater stress reduction from activities that, that are important to them and that those activities might differ from person to person. Right. Well, this talk has certainly generated a lot of discussion. We have one more question from Dr. Safet. Yes, thanks. Um, so there's this interesting literature about the anti-inflammatory effects of vagal nerve stimulation and the neural control of inflammation, you know, uh, with, by, by that pathway. I'm just wondering whether you, there's any way for you to image that or have, if you've done any work in that regard. We haven't done work in that regard. It's harder for us to image directly, but we, we are looking at some aspects of uh, the sympathetic parasympathetic activity balance. So, um, you know, for example, th there are simple tools for us to use. Uh, you can look at heart rate variability that gives you some crude index of that, but there are also more sophisticated measures of that as well. We haven't really started to investigate the more sophisticated measures, but have interest in that. It's, it's a really good question. So I, I hate to simplify it simply by saying it's sympathetic nervous system. Your point is well taken. Really the balance of the systems is also really important. Thank you. Thank you. Um Ahmed, I had a question about the first part of your talk on uh, PET CT imaging and arterial inflammation. I saw that um, years ago you had published a paper looking at the cancer patient population and doing sort of drive-by analysis of arterial inflammation on routine PET scans, um, and, and that that had good prognostic value. Um, is are there technical limitations or feasibility limitations to actually doing that in our cancer patients who are getting PET scans? Um, should we be doing that routinely? Really good question. So it's it's easy to obtain those images, um, and you're, you're, we're, we tend to use just the um, out of the box um, oncology approach to imaging. So no special prep, uh, no special uh, acquisition parameters. The challenge is the measurement. 
So right now it's, it's easy to get the arterial measure. It's a little more challenging to get the background measures and that takes uh, expertise that typically the oncologists, uh, those who are reading the oncology scans haven't been trained to do. What we're doing now is a multi-center trial, the, the PF study um, that we hope will tell us how instructive those uh, imaging parameters will be. Um, is it worth training people to focus on that? Is it gonna give us um, greater insights than what we can get from our, our, our current tools? Um, and are there simpler ways to measure the, the background? So a lot of these questions are being addressed on the on, in, in the ongoing study. Perfect, thank you so much. All right, so if there are no further questions, thank you very much, Dr. Tawakal, for a really wonderful talk. Oh, sorry, Rob, were you gonna say something? Oh, no, I was, oh. thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. All right, it was wonderful to have you. We'll see everyone else next week. Take Bye -bye. care.